That was probably more entertaining than I'm going to do. I'm not exactly sure how I managed to get up on this stage. I'm not a developer. Um, I build products, but I'm not a developer. So what I wanted to run you guys through was something a little bit different. Um, I do work quite a lot with, uh, with developers in my job. But uh, the gist of it here is I wanted to talk about startups and really how you fall, fall over and get back up is really the message. So in order to do that, I wanted to tell you the story of a product that we launched uh, last year in the UK. The product we launched was something called uh, Social Call. We came up with what we thought was a really, really great idea. We were sitting in the room, myself and a group of developers arguing about what would be the cool thing that we might be able to launch that would make people really, really interested in what we were doing in this new team we had just created in the UK. So we came up with the idea of letting you call anybody on Facebook in one click. And we thought this would just be a huge success. So we said, you know what? We're going to make it totally free. We'll make the app totally free. We'll make the phone calls totally free. We'll make everything work seamlessly and just make it beautiful. So the experience was download the app to your phone, in, uh, click to call somebody, as you can see here on the screen. You hit the button to call on Facebook, and instantly on their side, they would get a phone call on Facebook that they could answer and talk for free as long as they might like. I have to say, we were wrong. This thing was an epic failure. I think we had maybe a thousand downloads. It was not what we hoped it would be. It did not. Nobody really cared even. And much more than that, we saw about 20 other companies doing the exact same thing. The good news is it didn't, didn't take us a year to develop it. It took us about three months to get it out there. Once we had it out there, we saw the results. And then what we should have done, which we didn't do, is iterate quickly and bring out a new version of the product with some new features that address some of the core problems that we had with it. This is a fundamental thing in developing a product. You're going to need to do this. So I would describe this as a bad fail, right? So. In terms of the anatomy of a bad fail, uh, the, I've highlighted the things that we did as opposed to the one thing we didn't do. We didn't manage to write a 3,000-page high-level description of the product before we built it, but we did, because I work at a telco, so get a committee to review it and give feedback, and we did ask opinions of our friends and family before we got it out there. So we went out there and said, what do you think of this? And they said, well, we think you should do it this way. And instead of building something that might have been actually interesting and different, we ended up with a lackluster product people didn't really get, didn't address any needs, it didn't solve any problems. It was just another app in the App Store that fell on its face. I've done a few of those. So let me talk to you about the anatomy of a good fail. The anatomy of a good fail is all about, quite simply, failing fast and iterating violently. And what I mean with that is, when you're developing a product, you need to have the ability to change what you're doing very quickly. The Silicon Valley word for it is pivot. I'm not that advanced. I just say change. So what I'm showing you here is a product that we launched recently. Um, I'll show you the results in just a second. but. Uh, the first version you see here was a fail. Uh, the second version um, also didn't work. The third version in pink kind of reminds me of T-Mobile. That one didn't work out either. It was like a mashup of T-Mobile and Orange. In the UK, we have everything everywhere, which is a mashup. Maybe it would have been good for them. Um, the point of the story here, though, is we iterated very, very quickly. We tried out a bunch of new experiences, different types of look and feels. And then where we got to was a product that ended up with over half a million downloads in six weeks. And it's called To Me. I'd love it if you download it. It's written on my laptop, to.com, whatever. Um, but the point of the story here is really what we took from that and what we learned is that if you watch what your customers are doing, you listen to them, and you adapt the product quickly enough, they will stay with you as fans. And they'll start to become a community. So um, today, we've got this product out there. You could look at it and say, this is our social call 2.0. The key thing we learned in social call, nobody likes to be surprised by a phone call on Facebook. That was weird. People want to make free phone calls. People want to do free texting. People want to share photos. They want to tell you where they are, and they don't want to pay for it. 
Um, so we managed to take that customer insight and create a product that does that. Works on Android and iOS. Um, it's available now if you want to grab it. That's cool. But I'm not going to spend too much time on this. The key here is after probably six or seven different internal iterations, in less than 100 days, we were able to bring this product to market. We're really excited about it. It's growing really well. So the other thing to learn is, like I said, I failed a bunch of times. And if you look at my CV, which is earlier in the presentation, I'm happy to share this or whatever. There's a whole number of different people who've shown us failing is quite cool. You've got someone, um, I was trying to do more of an international audience as opposed to an American one. Um, you've got Beethoven with, you know, his music teacher told him that he was a hopeless composer. That's kind of sad. Uh, Walt Disney fired by the editor of his newspaper for lacking ideas. That's a bit surprising. Um, Henry Ford, the Ford Motor Company, was his third business. The first two businesses he launched did not work out. Even someone like Steven Spiel Spielberg, maybe you've heard a few movies he did, you know, he dropped out of high school, applied to attend film school three times, and just didn't work out for him. So, you know, these are things that we need to learn from. You can't necessarily spend your time believing what other people are going to say to you. You have to believe in what you're doing and deliver against that. So, th now this picture is probably a little um, controversial. I have to present this in Peru, or in, sorry, in Ecuador soon. Uh, hopefully nobody's offended. But um, what I wanted to now talk about is the process that we used and that, that we use around um, app conception. So it's essentially one method for you to consider in developing apps or services, if you want to apply it that way. It isn't the only method, um, and I cannot take credit for it, so I won't pretend to do that. In fact, this is more or less Apple's approach, uh, which I've essentially copied and will walk you through. Um, you know, they build amazing products, so they seem like somebody interesting to analyze. Not everything they, they launch works, obviously. A lot of stuff fails. Uh, but it's, it's a really good benchmark. So let me just take you through a little bit about how they do it and then how we've applied. So, and I'll take you through a few different apps to explain more or less this statement. So this is the whole cu crux of the presentation. The ADS is the core of what Apple does. ADS stands for Application Definition Statement. Um, I have someone on my team named Paul Burford. He's the one that explained this to me. On the back of that, we've developed some pretty interesting products. So that's why I want to take you through it. I'm not taking credit for it. He's up there. If you want to follow him, he's at Paul Burford. Um, so the goal of the ADS is essentially to define in the absolute simplest terms possible what you want your app to be. Very, very simple statement. And then what this ADS looks like, and I'll give you some examples in just a second, is what's special about my app? What does it do? And who is it for? These sound like simple questions, but they're not. So let's look at an app that most of us probably know. This is the Apple Photos app. You have it on your phone. Uh, so let's look at the, the ADS for the photo app. In very simple terms is an easy to use photo sharing application for casual iPhone users. Super basic. Tells you what's special about it, tells you what it does, and it tells you who it's for. What it doesn't say here is in photo editing software. It doesn't say red eye reducer. It doesn't say a hundred other things it could possibly do. What they've done is they've focused the message and the product very, very specifically on doing one thing, which is sharing photos. So then, let's look at another company, um, Mobile MIM. Not the catchiest name, I have to say, for an app. Maybe they could come up with something better. But what Mobile MIM does is it's a secure, that's what's special about it, photo viewing application for doctors to review medical images. This changes the entire app and what it does, who it's for, why it's special, changes the entire context of it. It's a super, super simple statement. Very, very, very hard to come up with. Um, but again, a photo sharing app, but with a whole different twist, addressing a whole different market and a whole different special. It's another one, right? Everybody, you've seen probably the Apple level commercial. You may have, when they first launched the iPhone, it was like the big thing. So what is, what's a bubble level app? It's a fun and accurate level application, which is what it does for the casual iPhone user. Clearly, it's not for the construction guy who's building your house. 
it's for you to make sure the photo on the wall is balanced, right? It's not like some high-tech crazy thing. But again, very simple, very clear. You know what it does. You understand it. You can use it. So using this f method, if you will, what I'd like to present now is how we build apps and maybe one way for you to think about building your apps. Specifically, the hardest thing you have to do. Um, and I can tell you we spend days arguing about this in the office. And then once we're done arguing about it, we take the backlog of all the features that everybody ever came up with and everybody ever requested it. And we go through it with this statement in mind and we just bash each other over the head with it. That doesn't meet that. That doesn't meet that. You're changing the, and it's just a long back and forth, but it ends up with something quite simple and good. So again, what's special about my app? What does it do? Who is it for? So the question is, what's your ADS? If you can get to that, you've done probably 90% of the work. So now that you've gotten to this ADS, what is it you're going to do with this ADS? Because it, now you've come up with a great sentence. Lovely. What are you going to do with this sentence? How are you going to apply it? So the idea here, as I said, is to use this ADS as a filter. Go ahead and take the list of all the features. Get everything. Every time you meet with somebody, they say, oh, it would be really great if your app did this. Say, great. Write it down. Put it in a backlog. Use Jira. Use whatever tool you want to use. Make sure you capture it. Run it through the ADS. Does this help my app accomplish the goal that I set out? Yes or no? It's a very simple filter. If it does, consider it. If it doesn't, put it in the backlog. Wait. Maybe later when you're in the version 2, version 3, version 5. Maybe it makes sense. Then, quite obviously, I think this is the lean startup uh, methodology. Get that minimum viable product out there. Get it in front of customers. I will guarantee you, whatever you thought was your business model, whatever was the idea you had, you're probably wrong. In fact, you may find that what you thought was the core of your product ends up not even being a feature that you launch with. I have some examples. I met with uh, uh, one of our Wayra startups recently, um, and, uh, and they came to me and they were really, really excited. They're like, we've got this amazing product we're building. It's going to be out in September. And whatever. And I was like, that's great. But guys, you also demoed me an event experience that you packaged up and worked really nice. And they said, oh, yeah, 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 but that's not the product. That's not the product. That's just a demo. Well, uh, to me, it was the product. And I actually thought it was really cool because they took the experience that I had had at an event, packaged it up, and made it available to me instantly. It's a company called Hyatt Life. Um, that was really, really interesting. But they didn't even think that was the product. They didn't think they could market it. They were on the phone uh, just yesterday with one of the biggest uh, ticket networks around the world. And guess what? The ticket network also thinks that the Hyatt Lights, which isn't their product, could be a really, really interesting uh, service for them. So the minimum viable product is the thing to focus on. And you may find that it's not what you expect it to be. So quite simply, once you get to the MVP, you get it out there. Listen to what your customers are saying to you. Once you have a base, so you've got a base, you know, 10,000, 5,000, 100 people, whatever it may be, listen to what they want and add features from the list. I'll give you an example. The Toomey product that we launched uh, earlier in the year, um, we launched in English only. What do we know? Like we're building an app. So we put it out there in English. The number one complaint we got, why isn't this app in Spanish? Had no idea we should have built it in Spanish. So one of the developers, who was an absolute hero, in three days managed to port the whole thing into Spanish, get it submitted to the App Store, and approved by Apple in three days, which was shocking. I've never, I don't know how he did that, um, I'm <laughs> but I was really happy about it. I think he also translated into Catalan and didn't tell any of us, but it's a different issue. Um, so once you've got this MVP live, add the features from the list, add the features from your customer, listen to what the customer is saying. The most powerful thing you can do is if you have a super user who's out there evangelizing your product and he's like, oh man, I really wish I did this, I really wish I did this, and then you did that, he'll be like the biggest fan of what you're doing forever. So if you can you know, listen to them and meet that need, it's a huge opportunity. And so the, the, the closing thought I really want to leave you with is something that um, I worked at a 
streaming video startup in Las Vegas, and it was not adult content. Just pointing that out. Um, it wasn't Vegas, but so more, normally that's one of the issues that people bring up. Um, and the, 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 the head guy at the time you know, said to us, because uh, we were struggling, things were not going well. Like, we were absolute failure mode. We were trying to do streaming video in J2ME in 2002. So this was early, early days. Um, and what he said to me is the only difference between somebody who's a successful entrepreneur and somebody who fails is a person that fails didn't bother to get back up when they got knocked down. Because you're all going to get knocked down with your ideas, your apps will fail, what you think is going to happen won't happen. But if you get up and you dust yourself off and you keep going, you at least have a chance at succeeding. If you don't bother to get up, you're finished. So that's pretty much all I want to take you guys through. I hope it was useful. I'm happy to share the slides. I'll put them somewhere, anywhere that makes sense. I'm sure we'll publish them on the Telefonica site, but I can put them up on SlideShare or whatever. So hopefully, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take those now. At what point do you consider it starting to fail? You reach a point of failure and you realize, I've got to start from scratch again. I mean, there's obviously failure where you can improve and then there's failure where it is complete, but you can at least take something from it. How do you gauge, what, what points do you gauge that from? So the question is, Are there more questions? Thanks very much, guys. Oh. There's someone waving here. Sorry. Hello.